theory that amateurs use, I didn't think to bring it with today, but it's a book the size of a phone book. So at this size, it's 1,300 pages. And that's just RF. There's another book almost that size for antennas. So it's a very, very big field. Uh, most people don't need to know even a tiny subset of that. But certainly if you want to start designing uh, electronics that does radio, transmitters, amplifiers, that kind of stuff, you need to get into some fairly uh, arcane stuff. Uh, this Tonight, there's no hardware. Uh, I'm just going with a quick run through about amateur radio in particular and why, that, why it's useful. And then if time permits, I will touch on the two fundamental things that make electronics useful for making radio. How it is we actually make radio waves with electronics. Um, to put it into some sort of perspective, uh, there are basically two ways to use what are called intentional transmitters. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens to emit RF that we don't license, like you know, motors in drills and toothbrushes. But things that deliberately transmit signal uh, tend to fall out into a license-free and a licensed category. The license-free is typically low-power devices, the industrial scientific and medical, the obvious ones. So Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, garage door openers, Zigbee, uh, wireless microphones, hundreds of different applications operate in some fairly small chunks of spectrum that are available for use without a station license or operator's license at very low power levels. <coughs> the other is licensed. And again, these are samples rather than a full list, but we all know about radio and TV stations. Mobile network operators are of course now the big one, and they are sort of buying larger and larger pieces of spectrum. Uh, you've also got land mobile, typically fleet management type systems. Most of those predate mobile phone systems, and but they often stay in use because they have characteristics that mobile phones are very badly. Things like push to talk, always open rather than a set of calls. Uh, marine is the same thing, but for ships. Uh, and then, of course, amateurs, who have the, the interesting added characteristic that, at least in theory, I'll get to that, that simple a moment, it's the only situation in which you can make your own transmitter and operate it without having it put through regulatory approval. So it's a, it is right on in the middle of people who want to make their own electronics. Um, IDA's answer is uh, it's for specifically that it's self-training communication technical investigations, people who are authorised, that is to say licensed, um, and without pecuniary interest. That doesn't mean it can't be related to your profession. In fact, a lot of amateurs are comms engineers, but it's that you can't be operating a communication service for the purpose of some business. Basically. Um, Amateur Radio has been around a long time. This year is the centenary year since the first US amateurs were formally licensed. Uh, this was not long after radio started being used, and it was because amateurs were playing with it and, and wanted to experiment. And this is sort of even prior to the World War II Boffin era where you know, guys working in their garages were inventing things that changed the course of war. Uh, it was at this point there were still a lot of people playing with it out of interest rather than in the context of a formal institution. Uh, a corporation or a university. And so that li the licensing arrangement and the public service obligations for amateur radio have been around for a century this year. Um, but sort of roll forward and from 69 when the internet or more strictly speaking <coughs> ARPANET was created and then cellular mobile and then mobile internet and now mobile broadband and, and new universal penetration, it's like why do it? We now have this uh, omnipresent comms network that's really easy to use, extremely reliable, lots of bandwidth, lots of applications, so why bother? And that actually turns out to be quite complicated. There are many answers. There are a whole lot of different things people do with amateur radio. And because it is something you can do with more or less as you wish, people take some, some regulations, people do a whole range of very different things with them. Uh, I didn't find quickly relevant photos for Tibet, but Haiti, same thing. Amateurs can walk in, literally walk in, with the gear on their back and set up and operate communications infrastructure when there is nothing. In a space where there's no power grid, no phone grid, the buildings, uh, you know, an amateur walking with a pack full of gear and set up a working comm station that can operate certainly over dozens of kilometres, potentially over thousands, depending upon a number of variables. And so these get used in emergency situations to forward messages back and forth between sort of the connected network of the rest of the world and either sort of individuals in need and dying need of help or emergency workers who can deploy ahead of the mobile network being recreated or indeed the power network being recreated. Not much good having a working phone if there's no power to the, the phone towers. And so, yeah, these are guys in operating in Haiti. Uh, th these sorts of antennas sort of yell, this was assembled by amateurs. Uh, but that's fine, it works. And in this kind of situation, they can bring it up and running fast. They don't need 
much coordination, although once they're on air, they can and do coordinate. Um, and equipment is available for deployment in these situations by various organizations specifically for this kind of problem. Um, another reason that it's of interest is the, the project uh, that Jim may talked about that uh, Harish held a workshop at Fourth Asia, which is Serval. Serval is the name of this kind of cat, but it's also uh, a project to establish working off-internet IP-based applications. So the intention is specifically in disaster recovery scenarios where the network is out to be able to build basic called email, chat, file sharing, um, information sharing type applications. We've got some servers, some radio, and mobile phones. Principally, it's why it's, it's phone-centric, but think Raspberry Pis and, and basic radio. And so in this case, uh, you generally do all this stuff on 2.4 gigahertz, which is one of those unlicensed use options. But knowing how to make intelligent use of antennas to make such a network work in a physical area you know, requires some understanding of RF. <coughs> Uh, apologies for the terrible picture, but uh, a nicety just because of the, how old the Amateur Service is, um, is that we have little licenses of spectrum all the way from 2 megahertz, which was considered the, everything left 2 megahertz was considered useless in 1915. It's like, yeah, let the amateurs have it. <laughs> so literally everything from 2 megahertz all the way to light was strictly speaking available to amateurs. Uh, in practice, of course, commercial applications have been found, usually as a result of work of amateurs, and so more and more of the spectrum is now in other uses. Notably mobile phones, but everything else as well. But there are about 20 separate locations between 2 megahertz and 24 gigahertz that are available for amateurs, so that almost everything that radio can usually be used for, amateurs have a slice available uh, to use. Uh, another big one, I figure some electronics porn is appropriate for this, uh, this group. Uh, this is some sort of RF amplifier. I assemble my slides so quickly that I don't know what sort. Uh, but you, in general, can't build and operate this kind of stuff in most jurisdictions. Uh, if you are not operating in and um, under a manufacturer's experimental license. So if you take your Zigbee and you start building and attaching stuff like this, you're breaking the law. Uh, I don't know about Singapore, in Australia that's a $150,000 fine on the first offence, <laughs> and jail on the second. <laughs> so they're, they're really, really touchy about it. And there's reasons for it. There's a whole lot of services that will collide and cause major economic and safety issues if people step outside the rules. And so the issue is more knowing enough about radio theory to even understand the rules. In fact, to get a license, you have to pass two exams. One is the theory, and one is the regs. And the problem is the regs are pretty simple, but the language they're written in is impenetrable to most people. So you've got to learn a lot about radio theory in order to understand what the regulations are controlling. Another really big one is power. So the low power device specs that I mentioned earlier, 2.4 gig, generally 1 gigahertz and above, you're allowed to use 100 milliwatts ERP. Uh, won't explain that tonight. Um, at, at lower frequencies, the 868, which uh, Sigfox uses, 900 megahertz, that's used for a similar sort of Zigbee type stuff, and also for mobile phones, very convenient, but they're right next to each other, um, are about five times that. And in a sort of XKCD, you know, oh, I didn't see you over there kind of a way, um, whoops, skip the slide. That's what amateurs can do. And that's in Singapore. In the US, it's five times that number. This is enough to roast a chicken, <laughs> right? So you need to know what you're doing because if you start doing this to your neighbors and your antenna isn't set up correctly, you're doing really bad things to your neighbors <laughs> <laughs> or yourself. So there's, there's, this is a, a, a very large amount of power. And this is, as I say, this is in Singapore where the, the limits are quite low. But if you're, if you're using the ionosphere itself to propagate radio, this is enough to get you almost half around the world, almost to New York, depending upon conditions and who's at the other end and all that other stuff. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting anomaly that this capability still exists in the, the modern world at all, let alone in Singapore. The, most of the amateurs in Singapore who are active are more interested in this than anything else, although increasingly they don't seem to be that active. Uh, I, I tried to put together a list of stuff amateurs do. This is a sampling, although it's probably 80% <laughs> of what amateurs do. Uh, the public service stuff is generally being able to route traffic during emergencies. It's not relevant in somewhere like Singapore, which is extremely dense, very small, and unbelievably well organized. But if you take Australia or the US, where you get these huge open spaces and periodic, certainly US tropical storms, the amateur, amateur nets actually come up to run, uh, to be available to deal with emergency traffic where phone networks are out uh, on a periodic basis every couple of years. And then certainly in Tibet, Haiti, other places where you really can just turn up. I mean, in coordination with emergency guys, of course, but without 
putting emergency workers in the situation, having to wait for networks to get prepared. Uh, DX is just long distance operation. And so this is this big thing about using the 3 to 30 megahertz slice to deliver signal through the ionosphere. And so there's um, refraction, there's multi-hop within the ionosphere, and there's, there's skip on the ground as well, where you can get signals being reflected at the upper part of the ionosphere and the ground. So this is this whole art. But yeah, that's, that's a 300 page text by itself, <laughs> explaining how all that stuff works. There's, there's four layers of the ionosphere, or three, depending on what time of day you look. Um, in the US in particular, um, there are 300,000 licensed amateurs. So the, the US, the amateur service in the US is extremely well developed. Uh, they'd have an annual field day where they are competitively handling message traffic. And the deal, the rules are no grid. You've got to be running off batteries, solar. You can use petrol power generators, but you, it's got to be something where you can run in a situation where there's no infrastructure. Um, the running of repeaters is really common to make use of a uh, higher location, so people use handheld gear to talk to each other. And there's, in fact, one repeater operating in Singapore, more to come. Uh, there are repeaters on satellites. There's about 15 or 18 amateur satellites in orbit, which actually have repeaters on board, and one not amateur satellite, which I'll get to later, <coughs> which also has repeaters on board. Uh, low power is a particular hobby. So yes, we can do 300, but there are guys doing two milliwatts long distance by all kinds of cleverness. It's very tedious, and the bandwidth is ridiculous, and I'll get to an example of that also. Well, the example is moon bounce, where the, it takes you a minute to send a 15-character message, and you need an antenna array the size of a small building to do it. So it's a, a tricky hobby. Um, meteor scatter. This is getting into the crazy area. Uh, as a meteor passes through the ionosphere, it leaves a, a trail of ionized gas behind it. If you are fast, you can use this to communicate. You can bounce a signal off it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that, the minimum communication is about five messages, three one way and two the other. And so, yeah, you've got guys who do this. Yeah. who are waiting for meteors to appear, and they're actually going, hello, yes, signal report, signal report, thank you. <laughs> it's like, oh my god. Uh, so the less ambitious guys use aircraft. <laughs> there are guys in Sydney and Melbourne, which is right at the limits of what you can do with an aircraft at 30,000 feet, who are seriously using jumbos as effectors. Uh, it's, it's fine, it's legal. By the time, you, if you look at the, the numbers, it all works out. The signal is below the noise floor as far as the plane is concerned. As far as the, the aeronautical radar is concerned, it's quite the bar. Uh, direction finding and fox hunting, uh, I've never done this, so I'd like to do it at some point, is you sort of hide something and then you walk around with Yagi's handheld and, and find a transmitter, a fox. Um, mountain topping is sort of taking the repeater thing the other way around and sticking yourself on top of the mountain, which gives a great increase in range, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, something I noticed when I was about 26 is a mountain that I visit quite frequently. This is the Australia Canberra Snowy Mountains. This is about 160 kilometers. And the oddity is, you can't see it in this map, there are no mountains in the way. There's a digital repeater on Mount Janini, which is just outside Canberra. And there's this Australia's third highest peak here, and nothing in the way. Well, hmm. Oh, and then there's a wormhole, I think, that relays amateur traffic through the internet at the Australian Defence Force Academy. But, hmm. So it should be possible to sit out here in the middle of a UNESCO heritage area and uh, <laughs> establish an internet connection. <laughs> now, nowadays, that's trivial. At the time, it was, it was uh, a little more difficult. So <laughs> that's, a, that's at the summit. Uh, so we carry it quite seriously. Uh, the laptop, the radio, the modem, a giant battery that you can't see, the mast, the antenna, a cable, which the antenna cable is quite heavy, the tent, the gyrox, the pegs, etc. cetera. Um, the 160 kilometer section worked. But the wormhole at the Defence Force Academy was broken that weekend, and it's a data centre in a Defence Force Academy. Nobody but nobody gets in on a weekend. I was only up on the summit for about four hours. So great. Um, so now, um, I'm sort of resuming my interest in, in amateur radio. Um, I want to communicate over similar distances, actually, but with more modern gear to talk to satellites. And so a satellite rig for handheld operation looks something like this. The antenna that's vertical in this case, it's the same kind of antenna as what I was using, the two meter band, 1.4 megahertz, and there's a 70 centimeter or 430 megahertz horizontal. And you, the, that's because the repeater has a, in the, in the satellite, has receivers and transmitters on two different bands so they don't interfere with each other. So your radio's got to be capable of dealing with both bands or two radios. The satellites themselves are tiny, sort of this kind of size. Uh, apart from one satellite in particular, which not only has a repeater on board, it also has astronauts on board, more than half of whom have amateur licenses. 
So hopefully <laughs> we'll be able to talk to actual astronauts in orbit sometime later this year. Maybe at Maker Fair, but I haven't yet got my license. I've got a license application in, but it, there's some stuff that's got to happen first. Um, and then, yes, my actual objective is a satellite that's even further away. <laughs> <laughs> and this is tough. This is, ex particularly because in Singapore we have a very low uh, power limit that we can use, and so you're dealing with unbelievably weak signals. You take uh, a waterfall diagram, a, a signal that sounds like noise, and what's coming back from the moon is 30 decibels, or a thousandfold below that. And so the method of recovering that message is probabilistic. You do something called message estimation, a bit of DSP that sort of tries. It goes, oh look, I found one. <laughs> so yeah, that's the talk for the day. Uh, very briefly, and I know I'm a little tight for time. Is that for the 20 minutes or the 30 minutes? 20. Yeah, okay, so I'll, I will drift slightly into Q&A. Um, I wanted to give a sense of, and this is sort of the focus for additional talks and workshops if you guys want to do them. Uh, the two fundamental things that make it possible for us to use electronics to make radio waves. So one of them is antennas. And then the fact that electricity propagates at no more than the speed of light, even in, in a, a bit of copper. And so if you think about a, think a church organ, rather, forget electronics for a moment. Imagine you've got a 300 hertz tone, which is about an octave below the C, um, and a, an organ tube that's closed at both ends and about a meter and a half long. So 300 hertz, the wavelength is one meter. Because sound moves at 300 meters per second. So you've got, <coughs> it takes one and a half seconds to travel the, the length of the tube. So you've got a standing wave set up. And you end up, because it's a, um, a near multiple, it's a half, the half wave, the quarter wave, uh, mm -hmm. it's an even number of quarter wavelengths. Mm -hmm. uh, you end up with these nodes stable once you get to a resonant sound. So think about an organ tube or blowing on a glass or what have you, how it, how it resonates. It resonates when you've got these nodes and any <coughs> nodes in stable positions. The same thing goes on in a radio antenna. Uh, the differences are one, there's a magnetic field involved, and two, the thing moves one million times as fast, 200 million meters per second instead of 300 meters per second. And so once again, what you're trying to do is set up a, a resonating uh, device, which is half a wavelength long. In other words, it's this. And so you've got, in the middle, maximum current flow into and out of the, the two quarter wave sections. And at the end, no current flow. So this is like a bunch of people running into and out of a room. The, you're actually pushing current into here, and you're doing so for such a short period of time that it's exactly at the time that the back of the end of the wire gets filled, you then start sucking it out again. That's resonance, as with the, the organ tube. So the principal thing that allows us to create or to detect radio waves as electrons is the antenna. And so you, the, the next piece is there happens to be uh, two fields associated with a radio wave. So take the what it has horizontal before, make it vertical here. So the, what we call the electric field oscillates up and down this way because that's where the electrons are moving. You also get a magnetic field, for example, called the H field, but I don't recall why, um, oscillating at right angles to it. So in this case, the propagation direction is, in this, is going this way. So you've got both an oscillating electrical field this way and an uh, oscillating magnetic field this way. That's so the field that's produced and the use of the antenna to get from electrons to uh, a magnetic field. The challenge is how we make an oscillator in the first place. Yes, nature is right-handed. and Well, that's going to matter in a moment because so this electric field creates this magnetic field, but as the magnetic field collapses, so as, as, it's big, as it's established, it's creating another electric field, also at right angles, in the opposite direction. So it's depending which way you label the things, not just either right-handed or left-handed. But yeah, if you've got a magnetic field, sorry, electric field growing this way, you get a magnetic field growing this way, and the fact of that magnetic field growing this way is now causing another electric field to grow this way. This is called reactance. So you, you sort of push uh, electrons into uh, an antenna or a coil, and it's pushing back. So this limits the rate at which, when you apply voltage, it limits the rate at which the current flowing through a coil, or through a wire even, can <coughs> increase. This, it's this fundamental thing that makes radio possible, but it also explains why we can build oscillators that are 
very low energy. So compared to just using a 5 by 5 timer with a capacitor and a resistor, I assume some of us have done, um, the typical approach in radio is to use uh, a capacitor and a coil. And so what's going on here is, uh, in a capacitor, a capacitor is a bit like a little battery. It starts empty, you push current in for a while, the voltage across the plates gradually increases. So this is showing you that as this current progresses, the voltage across, E is the voltage in radio land, um, the voltage across the capacitor gradually increases behind it. However, the inductor has the reverse characteristic. The thing I just described, you start, you apply a voltage to an inductor, the current is delayed because the moment the current starts flowing, a, and thus the electric field moves, a magnetic field begins to form, and the formation of that field around the same piece of wire causes a, uh, an electric field to form which is resisting that, that growth. It will stabilize, it will come back to a near zero um, uh, conductor, but it takes time. And so, in this case, <coughs> the voltage curve is this one, the, sorry, your voltage across the inductor is actually leading the current. You raise the voltage of the inductor, it then takes time for the current flowing through the circuit to increase. We know the current flowing through both components is the same because they're in series. It can't be another way. But something very peculiar is going on with the voltage. The voltage across the whole circuit is this. And yet the voltage across the inductor is higher than the voltage across the whole circuit. So if this is 10 volts, this might be 15. And the reason is this is 5 volts but out of phase, or negative 5 volts if you like. And so what goes on, at some point you get to a situation where the reactive components, both the, the capacitive and the inductive loads, components, are the same, they match. So you end up with something that behaves like a resistive load despite having reactive components. That's resonance, that's the point at which, so as with the antenna, you've now got the same thing going on inside an electric circuit. That these two things actually start to behave very differently once they're at, at the frequency at which. So for a given inductor, it has a reactance for a given frequency of such and such. For a given capacitor, it has a, re a reactance at a particular frequency of such and such. And it turns out that you can solve a simultaneous equation. And that for any pair of inductor and capacitor, there's a single frequency at which they resonate. And so when you build a circuit along, like this one, you've got some sort of signal generator that's putting out sine waves, and you're playing with the, the frequency. As you approach the frequency at which the reactants for these two are equal, in other words, resonance, the amount of current flowing suddenly increases. I'm not actually going to there's a whole other argument for that. But the oddity is that, yes, the voltage here can be a lot higher or a lot lower than the voltage being supplied. So if you're building a radio receiver, if this is not a signal generator but an antenna receiving signals from the moon, this is an extremely efficient way of, I think it's like millions of times as efficient as using um, a resistor and capacitor and amplifier of matching just the signal that you're looking for. And so it's, it's a fundamental pairing right throughout radio for receiving, for filtering, for transmitting that you use the inductor capacitor pair at resonance to give you the ability to decode a signal. Um, this is about the simplest sensible uh, transmitter I could find. There are slightly simple ones, but they get complicated to explain. The first detail to notice, though, is the same thing. The pairing of the, the inductor and the capacitor. And so in this case, it's because they're parallel rather than series, it's the other way around. You know that the voltage is the same across both components because it has to be. And so what's going on here is that as the magnetic field around the, in, the inductor collapses, you get, a, you get current flowing because you've now got a, a changing field, so current is induced back the other way, that pushes current into the capacitor. At some point, this exhaust and this is full, and then this more or less becomes conductive again, and you, it then begins to charge in the other way. And so, the, so if you had perfect devices, no resistance, and if you were not injecting or removing any energy, then this would just oscillate continuously, the virtual motion machine. You don't have this resistance, this heat, you're taking, you're taking power out, to put into your antenna to transmit. And of course, in this case, you're bringing a modulated signal in. But what this does do is resonate at a specific frequency. So as with the organ pipe or blowing over a wine glass, uh, all the other signal at other frequencies just gets damped. And the, the signal that you're trying to transmit 
is the one that is able to, to pass through. I don't know how much sense that made to anyone, but that, to me, was the most stunning bit of RF electronics. It's like, wait, that's what makes radio work in the first place with electronics. Um, becoming an amateur. So I strongly suggest anyone in Singapore who's planning to do it, uh, at least visit and, if not, and perhaps join the Singapore Amateur Radio Transmitters Society. Um, just because it's sensible, particularly in an environment where there are very few amateurs. And so for IDA, where this sort of corner case of weirdos, they have much more time to deal with the telcos. The people we deal with are called market access. So the amateurs really are just old god. So it's crazy amateurs again. Um, <laughs> so we have study theory and regs. Um, book, sit and pass the exams. There are two. They're not that hard, but if you've, you've got to learn the theory first. Uh, apply for a license, receive license. Uh, between steps four and five is a hard to estimate period of time. <laughs> I may or may not have a license by make it I hope you have one. Uh, importantly, in Singapore, do not attempt to purchase a radio, a transmitter specifically, before you have a license. The good news is the dealers won't sell them to you anyway, so it's by the by. But it's, you must have a license ahead of, uh, ahead of possessing a radio. And then, yes, at that point, you're on air. Um, I've gone slightly of a plan. Do I have a three or four minutes for a couple of questions, or am I...? Yeah, I think you do a couple of questions. Okay. Is questions? Does this make sense to anyone? <laughs> if we cannot transmit, can we, like, uh, infinitely listen to any band? So, uh, there seems to have been a change uh, recently. Increasingly, if you buy radios made, well, anyway, uh, for amateur, ra amateur use, they actually include a receiver that'll do everything from 100 kilohertz to gigahertz. With, you know, with a scanner. For a long time, Singapore had an absolute hard-nosed refusal to allow the import use of scanners, and for amateurs, that was making it difficult to get radios. Sometime in the last three years, that stance has changed. You still, RDA is still pushing pretty hard to ensure that amateurs can only buy, transmitters, buy radios that can transmit on amateur bands, but they seem to have relaxed about the receiving. That would suggest to me, and this really is conjecture, but that would suggest to me that whatever it was that was bothering RDA, and I'm going to hazard a guess that it was a security service or a emergency service still using an unencrypted radio has now been resolved. I don't know for sure, but I would suggest that those two, that those two categories of service have now all finally migrated to encrypted radios, which means that there's little reason to object to receivers. I don't know the fact. I haven't tried to buy a scanner. I'm not sure what happens if you do, but uh, it, it seems that there's been a, a change in stance in the last few years about receivers. So maybe. Uh, certainly there are software-defined radios floating around. More of them are receivers than transmitters. People are using them. So far, no one's got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would suggest that it's... Certainly for myself, the stuff I'm doing will be very visible. And so I will be hewing fairly scrupulously to what the law allows. <laughs> you know, and not doing this stuff without a license because I'll be publishing designs for what I'm doing and test results. That's not sensible if you're operating outside. But it's, yeah, I, gather, I have the impression that receivers are now getting... Uh, the idea is more relaxed about them. Sure. Each each treaty country uh, does its own licensing, uh, and treaty countries are almost every country. Uh, I mean, North Koreans could have Android, you know, Android licenses. It's it's just about everyone in the world. Somalia might be a problem. Uh, in general, there's a separate set of treaties about uh, reciprocal recognition. And there are usually arrangements a bit like driver's licenses that allow you to use a foreign license for a limited time under specific constraints. It is worth noting that amateur rules do vary significantly from country to country. There's a sort of broad normative set of frequencies and modes and power levels and, and procedures. And then each country has its own wrinkles. So it, yeah, probably yes. In, in RDA's case, if you have an amateur license, specific license, not just the certificate, if you have a current license at the time that you move to Singapore, then in most cases they'll allow you to do a conversion or they'll just ask you to sit the regulations exam, not the theory exam. If when you see Arduino projects doing RF transmission, are we doing something criminal? <laughs> um, so it depends how you're doing it. Uh, if you are using a Zigbee type device, no, they're, they're package modules that operate in a, in a controlled way. <coughs> Uh, it's been pointed out that it is possible to bit bash 100 megahertz FM directly out of one of the GPIO pins on a Raspberry Pi. 
like for real, and it worked yesterday. Um, <laughs> so the question then becomes, all right, so, so a little detail that I did skip uh, about you know, making your own electronics. It is a common thing for amateurs to do to make their own radios, except that I learned about two weeks ago that as far as I can recall, no one has ever attempted to license homebrew equipment in Singapore. And in Singapore, unlike most countries, amateurs are required to register all their equipment. We fill the same, we use the same forms on the website as the telcos use for their mobile networks. Except mm -hmm. we're doing one station instead of a whole network. But, so yeah, they want to know who you are, where you are, what you're doing, and then radio by radio down to serial numbers. Wow. And so in theory, we register every piece of equipment that we have that's part of that comprises the station. And, and so I said, okay, well, you know, I'm going to do some pretty custom stuff for what I want to do. Uh, so how do you do homebrew? And the answer was, uh, no one's ever done it. Wow. <laughs> or ever licensed it. Right, okay. Hmm. So not, not sure how that's going to play. But assume that uh, that obstacle can be overcome, then there would be nothing wrong with an amateur doing the Raspberry Pi bit bashing trick. Where you just you basically get a bit of wire and twist it around one pin and, you know, ta-da. Um, <laughs> and transmitting on an amateur band. But, you know, be warned, the... Uh, the band slices that amateurs have available are fairly narrow, and even then, there are often uh, spectral purity requirements far above what's required to stay in band. I figured the actual, I think it's 10 parts per million, two meters, and five parts per million, microbit above, which is a fairly tight standard to hit. So yes, you'll get a signal out, but the odds that you'll be operating inside the, the little constraints aren't very good. So that's, that's the other difficulty. I suspect the answer is if you're only upsetting other amateurs, then IDA is not gonna bother. But if you, the moment, bear in mind, if you like 144 megahertz has amateurs on it, but go down to 100 megahertz, it's not that far in RF terms, there's broadcast radio. And many taxi uncles listen to broadcast radio all day. <laughs> they will complain. So if this is part of why it's important that amateurs have chunks of spectrum all the way, Two megahertz or 1.8 megahertz to 24 gigahertz because yes some of those frequencies will get through concrete some won't but to be fair if you're communicating with someone else within Singapore a lot of the time it's going to be easier to to use the mobile network um, well it's there right? um, the other way you get around it is that you place repeaters at, at elevated locations and so then all that's necessary is that both parties have line of sight to the repeater antenna. So you can use small handheld devices and communicate through the repeater. Because yes, you've the same multipath problems, the same attenuation problems that plague RF in every other context, setting up Wi-Fi, running 3G, absolutely apply, because it's just radio. Uh, so voice channels, depending on the mode, uh, anything from two and a half kilohertz to about 15. This is this is amateur, marine, land, mobile, uh, even uh, avionic. They're all they're all similar size. So the amount of bandwidth they use is about the same. The bit of spectrum they're using will vary. Depends what they are. A lot of the land mobile licenses for security type applications are they're just somewhere else in the band. But I mean, to, so VHF is uh, 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. In Singapore, we have 12 megahertz of that. Of the 270 megahertz of spectrum, amateurs get 12 megahertz, which is a pretty big slice, frankly. But you know, there's another, whatever that is, 258 megahertz available for a whole range of other applications. So it's, they're sort of nearby, but not the same. That makes buying interesting. You have very strange conversations with dealers. <laughs> most, most of the dealers here sell amateur get band gear primarily to Indonesians. So you say, hi, what about a radio for use in Singapore? They're like, oh, no. <laughs> I cannot. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you can't? No, we just can't. So it's, it's challenging. You asked about this uh, amateur satellite. satellite you mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, so AMSAT is a, a club, globally, I guess, that, that raises funds to build and launch satellites. Um, okay, yeah. And it's, not, it's surprisingly easy. Um, the launch is the problem. The launch is about 200 grand for a CubeSat. And so that's got, to be, that's got to come from somewhere. And these things only have a service life of a number of years. They're, not, they're only at about 500 kilometers, so they do brush the atmosphere. They will return. So 
Yeah, I, I, just, if, I mean, if you're using them regularly, it might have to be sensible to join AMSAT and you know, page use, but you don't have to, it's just available. Uh, before I sort of give up the floor, um, what I want to ask you guys is, because this is a huge field and there's different things that might be of interest, uh, is there interest, firstly, just a quick show of hands, in future talks on other pieces of radio and or labs on radio? Is that, okay, I'm seeing nods. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. Um, are there particular things that come to mind immediately as being of interest? Antenna placement for servo type applications is an obvious one. Uh, any others that you'd like me to address in future? I think a practical session would be quite nice. Like, get hands on this. Okay, that's a little bit trickier. Uh, IDA has a, a quite specific rule about operating. And the only people who are allowed to have someone operate under instruction are educational institutions. Those actual words appear in the regs. So a teacher in a class can instruct and then allow them to operate. Uh, for any other context, it's not clear that that's even possible. Mm. I'm happy to do it. Let me get at least to sort of work through what's going on. Uh, and then so let what, me. What if you move to an ISM band or something? Will that. Uh, are, are you allowed to be registered as an individual instructor, or do you have to be... The, the, the words in the regs are educational institution, but <laughs> the... I looked at that and went, what? <laughs> are you kidding? Um, I suspect it's it's have the discussion, and I will certainly be having a discussion for Make Affair, because I'd very much like to be able to... The Science Centre might be an interesting... Ah, and that might be the answer to the question. Yeah. We may need an event license for Make Affair anyway, so yeah. it might be that we get science tended to apply organizationally and then we have one or more amateurs or volunteers uh, be the supervising operators at which point that problem gets solved. But yes, for a, a hands-on session, like a, a lab session on Hackerspace or something, uh, I would love to be able to do it. And so let me start with asking for a little thing, yeah. like can we do this for the Make Affair <laughs> <laughs> with the Science Center, and then ask for, so can we do the same thing with Hackerspace? <laughs> it's kind of an institution. So, yeah, okay. Uh, any other areas that are of immediate interest or obvious interest that people would be intrigued to either hear or talk about or do a lab on? I don't know, is there anything uh, for disaster relief, kind of networking? I don't know if there's also some data networks, if that's an interesting topic or if it's more important. Oh, oh the, data, the data network stuff, yeah, okay. So, so the, the driver would be the solving the antenna and RF problem because mm -hmm. you're then looking at the rest from the standpoint of radio is an applications problem. And so that's what Harish uh, is looking at with Serval is how to build useful stuff. At that point, that stuff is all just, you can do the Raspberry Pi and, and Wi-Fi. What radio brings to the, to the table is uh, doing intelligent things with antennas and with amplifiers, legal problems, but um, to establish a coverage over some area. And so, but yeah, okay, that sort of stuff, it's, it's related to, can, can we do useful uh, free, uh, free radio type stuff that goes on in, in several German cities using sort of multi-hop Wi-Fi. It would be an interesting experiment. I'm sure IDA would have kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I think uh, those interesting uh, miniature antennas interesting part. It's generally, yeah, so, so I mentioned the other, the, the amateur handbook is 1,300 pages, the, the okay. antenna, like, book that goes with it is, is only 800 pages. <laughs> uh, antennas are the art. And so, yeah, it's come to me with a particular question, and yes, certainly. Generally, the size of the antenna is a function of the, of the or inverse function of the frequency. Antennas small enough to go in phones are 900 megahertz and above. You should All right. you met some, uh, is a fellow entrepreneur guy in Iceland, really famous for his uh, antenna design, and they got some they have a lot of patterns and have a lot of papers. And he's a fellow in the country. So Here's Equal? Uh, I remember the name, but uh, we could try to invite for Tom or something. Yeah. 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 Ye